You're good to go. Hello and good morning, everybody. Welcome back to Reaper Pro Tips with me, your host, Anne, and disembodied voice Justin, and Kiri, although you missed her squeak. <laughs> Not many squeaks this morning. How are y'all? Oh, Kiri, are you playing with your ball? You're so silly. Silliest dog ever. Yeah? She's a silly dog. She's a very, very silly dog. So how are y'all? I'm, I'm seeing Nomad Zeke in there, but I'm not seeing anybody else. It's like crickets. You guys have to like be participating today. You have to, you have to be particip participatory, especially if you show up uh, this afternoon to my other stream. Ah, Alba Vazen, it's good to see you again. And thank you for the resub, 13 months, lucky number. It's magic. Just got here, poof. It's cool. I'm usually late, and I was on time today because I have a because today's grocery day. <laughs> Freestyle, thank you for the resub. Also with 13 months. Ooh. Okay, if everybody just resubs and it's all 13 months, I'm gonna wonder what the cosmos is saying to us. <laughs> hello, 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 hello. Just a reminder, everybody, I will not be here tomorrow morning. I have to take Kiri to the vet, and that was the only appointment I could get was during my time slot for this. So we, Kiri and I, will not be here tomorrow morning. Um, let's see here. Let me get down. Get down. It's time to get down. We're feeling our soul today. There we go. Boom. So look, we're going to pirate. I felt like a pirate day. It's not talk like a pirate day, but it's paint like a pirate day or paint a pirate day. One or the other. Good morning. It's a morning. Get David to fill in. <laughs> He's got a lot going on with his actual job <laughs> lately in the mornings. Lots of meetings. Um, so sadly, sadly, I believe that, uh, we will not be able to do so. So I felt like painting purple today, guys. Um, I would like you to tell me what purple you would like me to use. The primary purple that you would like me to use. And we will go from there. So, yeah, I like this mall too, and I, I really want to paint her purple. So, so what purple do you want me to use? Pick a purple. Any purple. A purple you have trouble with. You know, a purple you'd like to see me, like, like do. You know. Oh, no, you're late. It's okay, Karinika. Yes, good evening. <laughs> I know it gets late for you. So, uh, so yeah, so I need you guys to pick a purple. Pick a purple that maybe you have a hard time using or that you think is beautiful, but that you, you know, just haven't, you know, really managed to make yourself use before. Um, something like that. Or just pick a purple you like. Give me some purples. Give me some purples, guys. I feel like painting purple today. I'm liking it. I'm in a purple mood. Icy Violet kills you. Well, whoa, what's a what coincidence waiting off in the wings here? And Eldritch Purple. Desna Blue is kind of purple. I don't know if I have Desna Blue to hand, but I know that I have uh, Eldritch and Icy Violet to hand. Now, this will be interesting. Because these are diametrically opposed. Because, as you can see, one is very red and one is very blue. However, that's workable. What it will probably do is give us kind of a magical effect on her cloth. But I'm up for that. We can be magic. Nightshade, I don't think I have Shadow Raven. Nightshade, okay, so Nightshade's problem is that it's very black. Um, and although I have a lot of other off blacks, uh, Nightshade's not one of my go-tos. I may have it, but it's not in my drawer and it's not like a, a purple I regularly reach for. Uh, because, because it's got such a heavy load of black, usually if I need something like that, I'm just going to add black to a regular purple rather than use Nightshade. If you do use Nightshade, you have to be cognizant that it's extremely black. Um, and you have to treat it like a black. Treat, treat Nightshade as if it is actually a black. And work with it that way. 
and then you will get much more successful with it. Um, so just like we talked yesterday about how you can highlight black with any color, and if you highlight it with a vibrant color, then it will come off as if it's just a really dark shade of that color. Like if you highlight black with a really vibrant red, it'll start to look as if it's actually a really, really dark black red instead of black. Um, nightshade purple is very similar. So that's, you have to treat it as a shadow. If you use it as a base coat, then you're either going to take it up grayish or you're going to use a brighter purple to highlight it. And that's like, those are your two choices there. You also could do blue. It technically, it, it can shade blues because that's near black. Who <laughs> vote for magic? All right, so let's see. What do I want for my shadow? I can actually mix something very like Nightshade just by mixing uh, some black into Eldritch. So I can do that. Let's do that. That way you guys can, like, get that. Um, yeah, I'm more of a fan of black, black Indigo than I am of uh, Nightshade Purple, which is funny because when I created Nightshade, I loved it, and I used it all the time. Is this my black or is this something else? No, that's Blue Liner. But over the... Uh, over the years, uh, I've gotten a much more appreciative of, let me get my palette, much more appreciative of vibrant colors. And I under, I've i come to understand more um, how colors with a lot of black kind of need special handling. Uh, so as my, as my, and as I mentioned this before, guys, as how um, your style as a painter is strongly related to your color choices. So mine have definitely evolved over the years. Now, I always was a pretty saturated painter back in the day. I never got as muted as Jennifer, although I love muted color schemes when I see them, and I love delicate colors here and there. Uh, when it comes down to my gut choices, I tend to work a lot more saturated, a lot more bright. Um, so if we're going to mix a nightshade purple from these, we're going to probably do a half and half, pure black, and eldritch. And we're going to mix that together. I'm going to take a look at it and see see what it's done. So I've got two, two drops of uh, black here. Black is really strong, so I'm starting out really, really gentle. Um, hey there, Jarrett's Terrain Minis. How's it going? We are painting a pirate purple today, because that's the kind of mood I'm in. <laughs> and, I, and I'm ashamed to say I don't have nightshade purple, so I'm attempting to mix it from two other purples. Now, the advantage of doing this, by the way, guys, is that, of course, if we are starting with a base coat of Eldritch, or Eldritch even mist, mixed with Icy Violet, which I may do, and that may work a little better, um, then it pays to mix your shadow using a little bit of Eldritch. So even if you're using Nightshade Purple to shade this instead of the black where I'm using it right here, putting a drop of Eldritch Purple into your Nightshade is going to make those colors work a lot better together. Um, this is always, like, I can't see enough. I know a lot of people say they're lazy or that, you know, if question whether it's laziness or really whether you just uh, are kind of scared to mix things. But mixing gives you the power. Mixing gives you far more power to make your colors work together. It makes you, gives you a lot more versatility. Over time, it gives you a better understanding of what pigments are in each color and how they react. And knowledge is power. So, hey Val, thank you. Good morning for, yeah, four months. Only four months? But it seems like you've been here forever, Val. Here, I'm gonna go and make, uh, make my base coat. Now this color, the issue with using Eldritch Purple over black, guys, is that it's going to be really, really dark. And because this color has has less coverage, that could make a difficulty for us. So why are you scared to death of mixing? It's so easy. Like, your big problem, Val, is when you tried to mix, you mixed too many colors together. Always do two. Just pick two. All of this, so when you see me doing this, is always going to be two colors. Max. No, you can be scared to death of mixing, but you got to push yourself to do it anyway. If you want to really, really be able to knock it out of the park. Because, like I said, it gives you power. For one thing, you should never embrace your fears. You should never give them power, even if it's something silly like mixing. Um, and for the second, like I said, if you really want to understand how pigments work together and how, how colors work together, mixing is the way to go. Good, Kerniko. Yay! Yes, yes. I just felt like she had to be purple muses. I, I, I normally go like blue for the blue for pirates and blue for storm chasers, but I'm just like, you know what? I think that uh, Captain Fairweather needs to have a definite bias toward purple. So I'm going to do something weird and I'm going to mix a little bit 
of my icy violet into our base coat. This is going to do two things. One, like I said, it's going to make these colors work better together as mid-tone and highlight, because if there's a little bit of icy violet already in there, then it's going to work better when I use this color to highlight it. Um, and then again, I've got the purple. So you don't always have to mix the same color into your highlight shadow and mid-tone, but you should always have something in common between them. Yeah, there we go, Val. Mixing's more scared of you than you are of it. <laughs> hey there. Hey there, Margaret. How's it going? We're painting purple. So, uh, okay. So in addition to this making it work better with a highlight color, it is also going to give it better coverage because what does Icy Violet have in it? It has white. So this will enable our purple, hopefully, to go over this base coat. Now, I did do a Zenith Prime on this, as you can see, a really rough one. Zenith is not, I think, as effective on 28 millimeters um, as others. Now, given I used a gray overspray instead of a white, because at that point I hadn't dug out my Games Workshop primer, which is, uh, you know, a lot more smooth. Uh, but it still gives us an idea of where our highlights and our shadows are going to go. You can see right away there's a big shadow across her face from that hat. That's one of the things that this Zenith Prime is going to help us uh, figure out. But I'm looking at this and I'm like, yeah, Zenith Priming on 28s is, is all right, but I just find that it's not as effective. I find it's very effective on much larger models. So the bigger you go, the better your Zenith will work for you. Because sometimes with your spray, unless you're using an airbrush, if you're using a, like a finer tipped airbrush, then you can get a very small spray focal point. Um, uh, yeah, you tend to mix too many colors, Val. Mix yourself, just limit yourself to two. If you limit yourself to two, then it's easy. Not only is it easy to recreate the color, especially if you're like me and you always go like two to two or four to one or whatever, right? I tend to have ratios that I go for. So I'm pretty sure how I'm going to remix something if I've forgotten. And two, you know, if you take a picture of two colors, you, you just know it's, it's just so easy. You don't have to worry about it. And you're not going to get into something like you did with your wolf where you added nightmare black and it shifted the whole thing blue and you panicked. Um, that way, like the other thing is if you do make a mistake, you're only making with a few drops of paint. If you're only using a couple of colors, you should always test mix before you mix a big batch is another rule because I'm going to, I'm test mixing this. And if, if I screw it up, I'm like one, I have some room to, to shift it because I've only used five drops of paint and two, I've only wasted five drops of paint if this doesn't work. So there are all sorts of reasons why when you start mixing, only use two colors. I'm going to do my usual two to one on that roughly. Uh, and I'm going to do just one drop on our base coat because I know Eldritch is very transparent. So that means it's going to not want a lot of thinning. Let's see how much this impacts it. So just using one drop of that Icy Violet, you can see it made it a little lighter. It's going to give it better coverage. It didn't change the color a lot, which is good. This is a trick I often use, guys, with colors that are transparent that I still want to use because what we can do now is we can put this down as a base coat and it's going to cover better because I added that color that has a lot of white. What we can do over the top then is add pure Eldritch purple if we want to, if we really want this color. And then we can add another drop of Icy Violet to this and use it as our first highlight. So that's another strategy. If your paint is transparent, add a single drop of like do a four or five to one or even six to one um, of that color in white. It'll give you a color that's very close to what you want that has better coverage. Then put the pure version of what you want over the top. Because they're so close, you'll end up getting a great coat of the color that you most want and you won't have to sacrifice much. Maybe you won't coat of paint. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so keep it to that, Val. Just keep working on that. Oh, sorry, Jarrett. Jar yeah, Jarrett's train minis. I, I only ever use water. Um, Master Series, if you didn't know, all Master Series paint has Flow Improver added to it. Um, I'm the one who makes the paint line or made the paint line. I created Master Series. I've spent 15 years mixing every batch by hand and creating every new color. Um, recently I moved, so now Sadie does that, uh, my protege, and she's doing a great job. But, uh, yeah, we decided, like, when I first started this paint line, I knew that I was adding Flow Improver to every paint that I ever used. And so I was like, well, can we just add Flow Improver to an actual batch of paint? Like, will that work? And uh, we tried it, and lo and behold, it works just fine. So 
all of this already has an additive in it that's going to help with your flow and your leveling. So you don't have to add it yourself. Um, now, we don't do stuff like flow dry or drying retarder. That's uh, slow dry, sorry, like uh, or drying retarder. We don't add any of that stuff. And I don't believe in using mediums um, generally when I'm layering because what it will do is change the texture of the paint. And I find it difficult to get good results with that. So I don't add anything like glazing medium or what have you. Hey there, Ash. I'm going to go in. <laughs> Your phone is full of pictures of three to five bottles of paint. <clears throat> yeah, I just, the problem, Nomad Zeke, with me and Paint Rack is I just don't reach for my phone, like, to, I don't, like, stop to enter things in my phone when I'm working. Let's see here. Let's mix this up. As you can see, Eldritch Purple, uh, once I let it kind of fall off the side of the palette here, is going to be pretty darn transparent. You can see it kind of already going transparent as it's falling off the side of the palette. Let's get a little closer. So you can see how you can see the palette through here. And this is more high coverage. So in fact, if I pull this out, you can see that it's not as solid. And it's not a very different color. Now I'm going to fix my focus so we don't get that annoying wobble. And we'll come in with our pirate when we get Ms. Fairweather up here on, and in focus. There we go. Awesome. Let's go purple. All right. I'm going to use our mixture of icy violet. Let's see here. We want a purple hat and a purple coat. And we'll have to think. So look at that. That covers a lot better than this will. Here, let me do a comparison. Let's see. Computer Elders purple. So Elders purple and this. And it's hard to see on camera, but you can see a lot of the priming through the Eldritch Purple, um, whereas here, this is a lot more solid of a color with the white in it. So up to you, I would probably have to do a couple of coats of the pure Eldritch Purple, and I won't have to do um, with this. Now, if you're looking to preserve more of your Zenith, then you could go with straight up Eldritch Purple because you want to see that shift in the primer. Um, since that's one, presumably the reason that you're using Zenith is that you want a reminder of where your highlights and shadows should go. Uh, so if you're doing it that way, then yeah, you probably want to see as this dries, you can see the primer right through it. Like it's, it's really transparent. Brush rage. Oh, good. I'm glad you worked with them to get the Reaper paints on their magnetic. Thank you. Yep. Jabberwock is what we're working on. Yeah, so another paint app, but it's good. It's good we've got various paint apps, so we have choices. So yeah, so if we look, you can see the vibrancy of the purple on this side, and here you can see where the Eldritch purple is really fading in more. So depending, pen and paper work best for your style. Yeah, it's all, like, that's why we have multiple uh, paint tracking apps, right? Is that everybody wants something a little bit different. Um, so yeah, so if you are working with your Zenith and you really want to keep the, the difference, right? Keep your gradient available and uh, easily seeable. Then I would probably use the Eldritch Purple straight up uh, thinned so that you can, you don't lose track of where your primer and your highlights are. Personally, for me, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to do it like in the process. Like, um, actually, let me, let me just do that. Let me mix my shadow and my highlight because in reality, when you start to put down coats of paint, you cover up your Zenith all within two coats. Um, unless you're painting with washes. So this is our black plus, uh, Eldritch purple. And actually that's really, I need a little bit more Eldritch purple, but it's, it is shifting pretty close to nightshade. Hold on. Let me drop. So now this is, uh, going to be four drops of Eldritch purple with two drops of black. And the reason that I'm having to go so far on the Eldritch purple is that black is just, our black is really strong in master series. It's what gives it such lovely coverage, but it is powerful. Okay, that's really close to Nightshade Purple. That's really... I, I could probably add in two more drops and go six to two. So three to one, then. Eldritch to black should give you a Nightshade Purple. That's 90-22 equivalent if you don't have it. But it has a lot of black in it. It is built in a black base. 
So it has very little purple. It has just a hint, a hint of this. And really to see the purple, you even have to kind of stretch it out a little bit. See that purple? So now you can see it. This is nightshade purple. If you buy 9022, this is very close to what you'll get. And this is what people wanted to use for a shader. So essentially what that comes down to is look at the difference between these guys. I really need a color that's kind of halfway between these. And I need this. This is almost a liner. Like this is almost something that you would use just in the cracks between areas to set them off. I wouldn't use this as a straight up shader unless I was working with a much darker purple. So always look at, you call it your paper brain. I love it, Dee Clearman. <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, just use Excel. Yeah, I mean, use what works for you guys. I'm, I just tend to look at the color and guess because at this point I can mix anything I want. 15 years of creating Master Series paint means and can mix any color from almost any combination um, that's reasonable. So, so essentially, I hope you're listening. But yeah, don't go here. Don't use this and then try to use this as your shadow. Did you see how powerful that black was? When you try to blend this in on your model for shadows, that's how it's going to overwhelm this color. So you, you don't want that. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to mix a separate puddle of Eldritch. And I am going to do the Icy Violet as well because that's part of my color that I'm working with here. And I like it. And we are going to highlight with Icy Violet, so don't worry. I could have painted the whole model in Icy Violet, but then that would be a very pastel pirate. So painting pastel pirates is great and alliterative, but um, but I decided I wouldn't go there. All right, then take one brushful of your black mixture, of your nightshade purple. One brushful, there's five drops of paint already here, and mix it in. And see what you get. But be very cautious because this black is so strong, it's going to really significantly shift your color. It's probably going to be enough to build a good shadow by itself. So I'm going to add a drop of water. Always thin a little bit. All right, so you can see the difference between these two colors. Just one drop of black. Now that's a beautiful purple. I think you'll all agree that's a gorgeous, gorgeous purple. Um, <laughs> uh, you're funny, Jabberwock. Hey there, dog father. How's it going? Um, I've never, the green liner is good for swampy things, D. Clearman, but otherwise I was never a, never a big fan of green liner. Um, a lot of people liked green liner to do like washes over like orc skin and stuff like that. That's where I think it shines. Uh, for the red though, it's an excellent shader for like auburn hair, like, that's that's one thing that I really, really like red liner for. Like if you've got a dark auburn and not, you know, you can even use it as a very limited shadow in regular red hair, like more of a carrot top red um, and goth girl red. If you're doing goth girl red hair, you could totally use red liner. Um, so, yeah, so those are those are kind of because those liners are so specialty. Painting with jelly. We are painting with uh, with purple awesomeness. That's what we're painting with. All right. So now we have a decent shadow. Now, if you want your shadow to go a little darker, if you think that this is really just not quite dark enough, um, you could do an additional brush full of black, but it is really going to push it dark at that point. It'll probably still be okay. And it really depends on how dark you want your shadows. And it also depends on one other thing. Remember, I always say this, but remember that the closer together your midtone and your shadow are, the thicker the paint can stay. You don't have to thin it as much. So if you're somebody who does not like to work with really thick paint, but you still want to get decent blends, keep your shading color closer to your midtone. But if you are like me and you like to thin things a lot um, to get you know more dramatic effects and and to get like really really smooth blending without having to wet blend, then you can maybe put another brush full of black in here. Let's try it. Let's put another brushful of black in. A brushful equates to about a drop. It's probably on this big brush, the brushful may be a little bit more. But I use them interchangeably usually, guys. When I say brushful or drop, they are about the same amount in my experience. Yes, we're painting with grape. Absolutely. All right, so that is a pretty good shadow for this. I think you'll all agree. This actually looks a lot, it's very close to uh, Monarch Purple, my favorite color, 9239, um, although it's a little bit more ashy. And what's given that, uh, what's bringing that in is all this black. 
Uh, black will always give you kind of an ashen tone. It kills vibrancy. If you go too far, your colors will, will lose their brightness. They'll lose their life. You'll see them getting kind of grayed out and sickly. That's what carbon black does. So there are some colors that black doesn't interact with like that, and blue is one of them. You can still get an extremely vibrant blue with a lot of black in the color. But in most pigments, what you're going to get is an ashy tone. That's why putting black into skin tones is, is really dicey. You have to be very gentle about it and use it very, very sparingly. It can work for you, but it just, it's very titchy. Um, <laughs> we're jamming here. Grape expectations. You guys are so silly. I love you. Um, all right. So let's get on to this. Oh, and I need a highlight. Dang it. All right. Wait, wait, wait. Stop the presses, everybody. We need a highlight color if I'm going to paint like Anne. And I kind of want to paint like myself today. I'd rather not paint like someone else. All right. So let's do a two and two. <laughs> you guys are so funny. All right. So do to do. So just a reminder, as we've got more viewers now, um, I will not be on tomorrow morning. I have to take Kiri to the vet, and it was the only time I could get an appointment. Uh, so tomorrow is Kiri's vet appointment. I will not be on. I will be on later today on my own channel, twitch.tv slash painting big. We are going to create a character today, guys. I realized that um, it's time to create our bard. I've never created a 5e character before. So this is my first time and I'm bookmarking everything and I'll have everything ready so it will go fairly smoothly and we can decide, you know, like her starting spells and what skills she has and assign her stats. I rolled a lot of stats last night um, and so we have to decide who gets what stats and uh, yeah, it'll be fun. And uh, so yeah, that'll be at 4.30 uh, p.m. Central Time on my Twitch channel. All right, so I'm going to two and two here. A brushful, i.e. a drop of water. And see how light that goes. That's a pretty color. But it is definitely shifting toward blue now. And what will happen, what tends to happen when you've got a, a warm shadow with a cool highlight is it tends to look a bit, a little bit weird. It tends to look a little bit like that psychedelic fabric that looks purple and then shines blue when you hit the, when it hits the light. So it's going to probably go that way because we're using such different colors. You can make any two colors blend together. You just need enough transitions or to thin it enough. Um, let me get up a nice puddle of pure icy violet. Everybody loves this color and nobody, everybody's afraid of it. So I've got a little bit still of the previous color on my brush. So this is going to kind of tamp our icy violet a little bit toward, there we are. It's a pretty, pretty color though. Beautiful, beautiful color. Boop, boop. Oh, you have a Raphael. Had to get the 8408. Uh, didn't have the 8408. That's so sad, but I'm glad you got one. It's going to have probably a wider tip than mine, um, but they're still great brushes. And a lot of people I know like the 8404, so I just only have the 8408. I think I, I uh, intentionally grabbed the brush that had like the razor thin taper tip, which I tend to adore, but it's not for everybody, so... Hopefully it will work for you. Now, I threw a lot of extra water into this Icy Violet, guys. It's got a lot of white in it, remember, so you have to add more water. All right, now we've got a highlight, a shadow, and a midtone mixed up. Actually, we've got two highlights. So now I can really paint with impunity. I do um, like to kind of have all of that mixed up and ready, uh, along with a liner color. In this case, we're going to use our, our very dark, uh, quote-unquote, nightshade purple to do shading. So like if I run into an area where my primer didn't quite take like that, let me grab my, grab my nightshade and just block it in. Ah, that's a sash around her waist. I see. All right. Well, I'm going to block that in with dark too. I can always do it in a different color if we decide it's going to be a bright color. So, all right. And you know, at this point with these recessed areas, guys, where your primer might not have all gotten in, it really just paint paint over it. Uh, you're not going to rub it off. It's way back in the recesses. You don't need to put primer back there. I mean, you can if you want, but I'm just going to paint it in because I like it to be nice and dark. Well, and technically that's going to be the inside of the purple cloak anyway. So, all right, here I have a shadowy area back here because I've kept her back dark. I want the light hitting her front. I want a dramatic effect, I've decided. Um, and so... 
I can see that I still have my white here. So if I'm going to be using my Zenith, I want these colors mixed up from my, from my light to my dark. And I want to paint um, remembering where all my highlights are. So I can see there's a very sharp highlight up here. And I can see that it's kind of a, a, a little bit of a shadow here. And then it goes up to a lighter area down here. So right away, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab my shadow and I'm going to block that in first because I can see the shadow and I see the highlights. I'm going to just block it in. Don't worry about blending. Just get your shadow down. And it kind of blends in. So like if you want to grab a little bit of your midtone and do some wet blend here to just remind yourself that it's coming up toward highlight, you can absolutely do that. I tend, if I like, if I'm moving fast, I like to do wet blending um, on a Zenith piece. I know that two coats of paint are going to cover up my Zenith and I want to get those colors in. So see, these are very different purples that we're dealing with. So wet blending, if you're using thicker paint, is one way to make things work. Now this doesn't give you a perfect blend. You can play with it until you get close. But that gives you at least a start, something to work with. And then remember up here, we've also got much lighter colors. I'm going to start with my mixture of icy violet and purple. I can't forget that shadow though. There's a really dark shadow here where there's a crease, a fold. And I want to hold on to that. So catch yourself if you start to paint over it. That's why I block in the shadow like super dark where that way I can work around it. It's a reminder to me. And I know that anywhere up top, that's since the light is falling from the top, I know that anywhere up top is going to be lighter. So if I can just remember where to keep my shadow dark in the appropriate area that my Zenith showed me, then I'm pretty good. So that's really light and it's really purple. So what I need to do is carry this color down. I'm going to actually hit the edge. I'm going to edge highlight with my uh, Icy Violet. What that's going to do is it's going to tie together the highlight up here and the highlight down here visually. So it's kind of a little trick. It may not be strictly realistic or, uh, you know, because I tend to go for realism, but it's in the, if you're trying to tie together a very different highlight and shadow, it is a good trick. And then I'm bringing up that highlight just a little bit more. I'm going to grab a little bit of my purple to blend it in a bit more, bring this up a little bit. Like I said, I'm not getting perfect blends, but if I want to, I can thin my paint more. Um, and really that's the whole, that's the only thing, you know, if you're trying to get blends and you're having a problem, you probably haven't thinned your paint enough. I do need to get a little bit more purple up here around this icy violet so that it works because these are such different colors. I need to really show them playing together on every surface to sell that, to sell that that's the highlight. Now I'll be mixing probably some icy violet and white for my like final up up highlight, but thank you for the Patreon push Otter Mama. Yeah. I also have a Patreon and I actually did cover colors that work well with icy violet in a PDF that was, uh, I want to say it was 2019. It was close to the start of the year. Cause that was before I moved. Um, or sorry, 20, it may have been, it was either last year or the year before I'm losing track of time, everybody. Um, but, uh, but there is an Icy Violet PDF that talks about color theory for Icy Violet, what goes with it, shows examples of it so that you can see it, and I explain why. Um, so if you uh, are on the Patreon, I think it's at the $5 level. That's where most of my breakdowns of paint are. Um, it's the color workshop tier. But if you are a patron and you love Icy Violet, you should look up that PDF. But do you see how I mean how I when I say that it's going to look magic? right? Because this is a very unusual, like to go blue with a highlight on a reddish purple is very unnatural. Your eye knows that it's unusual. And so your eye is trying to rationalize it. Um, and the more deep saturated reddish purple you put in the shadows, the more your eye is going to be like, whoa, this is, this is weird, you know? So it's going to, uh, it's just going to read as a very unusual fabric, a very modern, or in this case, since we are uh, working with a medieval type figure, or at least a Renaissance one, um, it's going to look magical. Now, the other thing we could do, um, and it would be again, odd, but, uh, it could be done 
is if you want all of your light sources to be icy violet, if you essentially want to suggest that this is doing this because there is a, a, a magical light source of this color, which is something that you might do in, say, an underdark setting. If you were working, you know, with colored fungi that are, or magical lamps that are casting an unusual color of light, then you could essentially mix all your highlights into something with this color and white, and it would create a bluish cast across the entire figure. But if you do that, then you run into what David was talking about with his, uh, with his uh, OSL, with his uh, the other source lighting uh, class, right? Where then this color is going to influence colors that are beneath it. So any skin tone is going to go gray, you know, and you might not want that. So those are things to think about, you know, your options. Um, this is very dark back here, so it's not going to get much of that icy violet. It's going to get a little bounce light from the environment. It'll have a little bit, you know, there's enough light for it to be picking up this. So there'll be a little bit of highlight back here, but not a lot. We're keeping it dark because I did not at all highlight it. So we're definitely dealing with an overhead light source coming from the front that's leaving the back of her in shadow. So dramatic, dramatic pirate is dramatic. Yeah, kind of. It's just, it's the color uh, dichotomy that's odd, Kariniko. Having that warm color and then that cool color. And now you can see that on velvet and silk, especially if there's a cool light. Like if they're using a cool fluorescent light um, or a bluish daylight light over, like to light up a purple. Then you might see something like this. Um, so that's why it's, it's looking odd. But you can still do it. If you like it, you can still do it. There's nothing... Nobody is going to pop out of the walls and say, you are doing something that looks weird. Now, you know, somebody on the internet net might say, that looks just weird. I don't like it. You know, but, you know, if you like it, that's all that matters. Say, I'm sorry you feel that way. I really like it. And go on. <laughs> Move on. <laughs> Never let other people's opinions of your art shake you very much. This person has just given you valuable information, which is that their creativity does not align with yours. Let's see. Let's block in. Let's grab our midtone and block in our, the rest of our purples, and then we can... Uh... I know where most of my highlights and shadows are going, so I don't so much need the zenithal. I like it because it reminds me to keep my shadows really dark. Here on the sleeve might be one of those areas where I actually do work with everything wet blending because it's got it's highlighting her uh, fo the folds of the sleeve actually very nicely. So if I want to keep that, then that's an area where I would now reach for everything and start working everything together again. I did block in the shadow. If you get like way back bits here, like there's this hollow right here between her cuff and her um, her waist. Just block it in with your nightshade purple. Yes, art is subjective. Yeah, this would be a great unnatural purple skin tone. Um, for sure. It is going to look magical. It's going to look almost chameleon. So if you put this skin tone on, say, a succubus, um, she really is going to look like she's her, her skin tone is like glistening or sparkling or doing something odd because you wouldn't normally see this kind of gradient. Like I said, it's not very natural to have a warm purple shadow with a pale blue highlight. It isn't like standard. Uh, so it will look odd. All right. So what are we doing on this sleeve? We are right away. You guys can't see the, you can kind of see she's got that nice fold right there. So again, I'm going to take my really dark color maybe a bit of my nightshade purple with my shadow color. And I'm going to line that line so I don't miss it. I'm going to essentially dab in all of the, the uh, folds that are dark and keep them so that I know to keep them that way. And then I'm going to go with my light colors over everything else. I mean, it's, and, and if you see, this is why mixing is, is um, key Val. Like, and I suppose you could do it with the airbrush if you wanted to, but doing these transitions is key in getting these colors to work together. The more transitions you mix, the easier it is to blend two colors that are very different. Um, so that's why learning to mix is really gives you a lot of power over your colors. It makes it easier for you to blend if you are mixing. Alright, so 
light, purple, a little bit of dark, keeping my fold there very bright. And as long as I've got a bit of my lightest color on that fold, it'll remind me that I need to punch up those highlights. Now around this bucket of the sleeve here, I do need a darker shadow. I want to line. I don't know what color the sleeves are going to be yet. Sometimes I make them the same color as the coat. More often I'll reach for a contrasting color, but I do want um, a very dark line to differentiate between them and the rest of the coat. So wherever my zenith is kind of spilled into that, I'll put a dark shadow so that I can really define um, the difference between this cuff and the coat. Yes, art is definitely subjective music, muses touch, and too many people don't view their mini painting as art. I mean, certainly if you're paint by numbering, you know, you could call it a craft instead of an art if you wanted to. Um, but I mean, at some point when you're making color choices for yourself, it does become art. Uh, I mean, color and brush treatment are valid, you know, artistic disciplines that define a painter's style, and so... I personally feel that mini painting is art. It certainly elevates itself to an art form in the very best practitioners. I've always been on the side. It's always the, it's always been a big argument online since mini painting started to really boom around the end of the nineties. It's been a huge debate whether what we do is art or craft. And as with almost any art, I think you could go either way with almost any art. There we go. We got some, some good, uh, well, I mean, it is at various levels, like, but HM Road Dog, I don't feel that what I do is a craft. I feel that what I do is art for sure. It engages the same, same part of my brain. But if I was doing like, there are times like maybe I'm doing minis that are just, I'm just churning them out. They're paint by number, you know, like maybe my army miniatures or whatever, then I feel it's probably a craft. I'm not utilizing creativity. I think for me, the line is creativity is, uh, is how much creative you're being. Now, some people wouldn't, you know, wouldn't agree with that and a lot of people, I think that it's a mistake to call crafting, like, like imply that it's less than art. Like, I'm not a fan of that at all. Um, but at the same time, I feel like sometimes people who do it tend to downgrade themselves a little bit. And that I wish they wouldn't. I wish that I wish that you could see that craft and art is the same level of of creativity. And some certainly crafters, like people who are like big name crafters like who really really take take what we would call you know just crafts quote unquote and elevate it right those people are definitely artists i wish they would call themselves artists it is one's card it can be or i should say it can be right because it's like there are different levels of it uh, but i think once creativity kicks in that's when it becomes art like and a lot maybe a lot of crafters themselves don't like art as a term I don't know. I don't understand it. It's a very complex subject and a lot of people feel very strongly about it. But back when mini painting was first like getting traction, a lot of people looked down on crafting. It wasn't like today where, where there's whole channels about crafting and crafting is hugely popular. And a lot of people believe that it is absolutely art. And I agree with them. Um, but it's like, it was very much a put down like in those days, those days and some places it still is. Oh, well, you're just doing your little crafts, you know, and it's like, wait, what? I don't know. Hey toad. How's it going? Super. But yeah, it's always, it's always been, and it's hard for me because I'm like, I grew up in that era where crafts were considered less, right? But art was considered like you're getting above yourself. And so neither one of them had a good reputation in different ways. 
Right. You know, but that's not, I don't think that that drawing is part of it. Like, why should you have to draw to be an artist? There are so many people, freaking uh, Jackson Pollock, he couldn't draw. <laughs> um, Andy Warhol, you know, there's so many people, there are people with freaking art, you know, paintings that go for zillions of dollars and they couldn't draw. <laughs> Yeah, you can take, exactly. HM Road Dog, good point. That's exactly my point. You can take a craft to the level of art. Now, the disagreement happens, the disconnect happens, is people disagree on where that is, right? I don't know. I, I think, I, I really dislike the fact that uh, so many... Um, and this is purely the traditional art world here, like art museums and such. They're getting better about it. But for a while, if it was what they would consider a craft, there was no place for it in an art museum. Now things like quilting, quilts are getting into art museums, you know. So I love that. I love that, you know, there's starting to be a little bit more opening up there because the art world has been kind of bad about that over the years. Well, kind of bad about that is, is an understatement. <laughs> All right, let's mix a, a highlight that's actually even higher. I want to do um, Icy Violet and Pure White. Exactly, Wotans. People like to be important. I know, Dabber, and I hate that. I actually hate that. I hate the mystification of art. Like, what do I do every day? I teach you guys, I share with you guys how to do art. I try to make this accessible to you. I consider miniature painting an art. I share it with you. I try to teach you what I've learned. I want to make this accessible. That's my entire goal is to make miniature painting an art form that is accessible so that people can be happy that they are artistic after all, damn it. Like, I feel so powerfully about this. Now, if you, if you really don't want to think that what you do is art, I mean, you know, go on with your bad self and, I, and I'll just, you know, I'll move on. <laughs> but, but dang it. But yes, making this accessible, making this accessible to people is like my highest goal. Like making everybody believe they can do it and have a creative artistic pursuit in their life that they can get really good at. All you have to do is care about it and work at it. You can get really good at this and make things that make you happy. Like that's it right there. De-stress, make things that make you happy. Hey, bald GM. Yeah, exactly. And painting minis does take a little bit. I think the reason that people tend to like look down their snoots at it is, uh, you know, that it's actually a collaboration. They don't think of it that way, but you know, you're collaborating with the sculptor who made the piece in the first place. And for some reason, People seem to, to think that this devalues what we do, and it's not that way at all. Um, I, mean, I, I always say I learned a heck of a lot more about painting from painting miniatures than I ever learned in my art school classes. And I'm totally not lying there. That is absolutely the truth. Um, it means I didn't have a great opinion of, you know, the art department that I studied in, but there it is. And it could have just been the instructors I had, of course, but, and it certainly was in a couple of cases, but, but yeah, I mean, I can't, like I said, I use the same muscles, the same mental zone to do this that I do when I draw. And I've been drawing for a very long time. <laughs> you know... I don't ever demean, even if it's just a banana duct taped to a wall, I never demean it, Shadow Raven. That person, like, meant something. Now, of course, there there are probably a couple of abstract artists out there who honestly, like, are just like, haha, what can I do and get away with and sell for a million dollars, right? Totally. Um, but there are also people who are just looking at the form of a thing and trying to get you to look at it in a new way. Like, that is part of art is getting you to look at something in a new way. If I paint this this uh, pirate all magical and, and sparkly, you may not like it, and you may think it's horrible, but it'll get you to look at the miniature in a whole new way. <laughs> and that, I think, comes from movements like Georgia O'Keeffe, 
where she focused in on ordinary things and made you look, wanted her whole thing was take this little part of something out of context and make you look at it in a new way, make you see it and not pass over it. And the people who are doing that kind of place art, placement art, where they're taking found object objects or they're taking normal things that you just never look at, like a freaking banana duct, you know, and putting it on a wall, they're saying, look at this. This actually has some cool stuff about it. And I want you to look at it differently. I want you to take this out and consider it. So. <laughs> yeah, Dragon Eye, that's exactly it. That's how I feel. Um, and I've gotten a lot more open-minded toward modern art. There's still, uh, there's still guys, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of modern art, art that just does not appeal to me. I very much love classical painting or, or, um, I like painters with chops. I like painters who show me what they can really do, uh, with color and texture, but I do like some abstract stuff. Like if it's got really interesting textures and colors then I kind of, you know, I could easily put some abstract art on my, on my wall. Cause that's, I'm all about color. So for me, if you're doing something interesting with color, then I like it. Um, so, uh, but yeah, there is a lot of modern art I just, I can't connect with or just haven't yet connected with. I tend to like uh, classical art. I love Baroque art. I like the Impressionists, depending on them, you know. I love Van Gogh, but I also love Michelangelo. So it's like, and I love Seurat, and I like, you know, I, I love so many different artists for all their different styles. And I am glad that David loves to go to art galleries, so I actually get to more art galleries. I'm just going to do a quick line here, guys. We have a tiny little line here. We, Even though everything is uh, Zenith primed here, this is where Zenith priming is not always like, you know, you do have to kind of do a little work on your own here. Um, so the Zenith made this all one light, but because it's also where her bodice comes in around her chest, um, I need to put that line there. I need to put that minimalistic shadow there. I need to separate these two things. And also I put these shadows in around the uh, coat so you need to you do zenith all cannot do everything for you you still have to introduce shadows here and there and sometimes you want to pop highlights so like let me go and shade here and then uh i'm going to go in with a white actually and pop some highlights let's do that let's show you guys how to work with zenith we'll do both we'll paint purple and we'll zenith today Wotans, honestly, if you walk into one and you have fun and you enjoy looking at the art, you're enjoying it fully. <laughs> uh, and nowadays, all the art galleries I've gone to, David, uh, gone to with David, um, have like uh, headphones. So if you really want to explore it more from the art BS perspective, <laughs> uh, in other words, somebody else's interpretation of what the artist was doing. Uh, you can do that. You can listen to them. Some of them also have some interesting notes on what the artist actually said about the work, which is to me a lot more interesting than listening to somebody else dissect it. Um, but, uh, and you know, you may get something out of somebody else dissecting it if they have a very invasive mind or they have very interesting insights. So, but I, I think that, um, everybody can enjoy art, just enjoy it by looking at it. When we were uh, first dating, David and I went to a lot of museums. My birthday present when I came out here for my birthday was to go to the, um, the Asian Art Museum in San Francisco because I love Asian art. Um, but uh, we've also, we've done the De Young and we've done the, um, oh, what is it? The big one, the one with the old with Rodin exhibit. It's like I'm losing it here. You know what I mean. We went to a lot of really cool um, museums. And I hadn't been to art museums since I was much younger. College. Um, so I was really happy about that. Ooh, Warhol exhibit. Neat. Wait, wait, wait. I have to get back. People are sharing. Oh, the medieval armor. Yeah. And, and I hear um, the Met, the New York Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh my gosh, has an amazing armor section. And that could be a great mini pinning. Right. Oh yeah, totally wounds. Like that's, that's very valid. The greater of an understanding you have of something, the more you will, the more you will be able to appreciate it on a different level. Like me, now that I can paint like this, when I go into a gallery, 
I can look at those paintings and judge what techniques they're using, right? And which pigments they're using and things like that. And that definitely does expand upon my enjoyment of the, of the experience, right? Um, but any of us who miniature paint can get that actually. So it's not unattainable and it doesn't require a lot of work to get to that level where you can enjoy things more like that. Uh... Oh, that's funny, Saltor. Yeah, when you're go when you're doing an art exhibit with somebody who's really knowledgeable, they totally can. Y you will get a bunch of people listening to you if it's interesting, right? And usually it is. Yeah, sometimes it can be kind of awkward and blah. You know, it depends on the guide, right? Ash, like some docents are really good. At, at opening art to to people no matter what and some just want to make you think it's like artists right everybody's got a different approach <laughs> you would totally buy beetle art <laughs> Kerniko, that's awesome chicago art institute yep i love chicago art institute they have one of my favorite van goghs and they've got the surat that everybody knows how would you paint an explosion? Explosions have to be white at the core, Valandar, for them to look glowy. And then you would use pale yellows and oranges. <laughs> I need to go educate your kids. Yeah, I figured Saltar. I figured Tessa. I like I like that name actually. Yeah. Well, you know though, Chibi Amy, it all depends on if you need the piece of paper. I've never needed the piece of paper. Like, just go out and educate yourself. Get some art history textbooks. Enjoy reading them. You know, look through those textbooks. Find artists that really excite you. Get, you know, find some good articles or, or you know, things written about them. About, and decide, you know, who you really like. I've got so many art books. Um, every time we, we, we go to an art museum and I really, really love somebody's work i'll pick up i usually will go to the art museum store and pick up the book like james tissot who i've brought up before as somebody who's a master of textiles and cloth patterns and cloth textures like i still i still want to groove on that like i'm i've got his book and i had to remove it from the table because i'm not working on anything that's big with big cloth areas right now so i can't do it um but uh but yeah there's uh, so much there's just so much yeah sunday in the park <laughs> It's so lovely to see that. I love that painting. Yeah, why bother with a piece of paper? If you're already doing the fun stuff that you love and you're making a living and you're good and you're not you're not trying to turn it into a career, you don't really need a piece of paper. Although, I won't say, if you've got the cash, going back to school for a subject you really have learned that you love is not a waste. I mean, you totally can get a really thorough education, especially if you're really into it. Then it makes sense, right? Um then maybe you care. Maybe it's like the piece of paper is like just the cherry on top. Oh, the Louvre. I have to get there, Wotans. The minute that we this epidemic, this pandemic is under control and after Curie is, is passed away, um, then France. France is on the list. Oh, yeah. David was in, uh, David goes to Ireland, to Dublin, to work every once in a while, and he was in um, the gallery in Dublin and really enjoyed it. I wonder, I, w I would love to see the Scottish galleries. I don't know. Frazetta himself, I think there is a Frazetta museum out east, is there not, guys? Like, although he sold so much of his work that I'm really not certain if the Frazetta, if his, um, you know, his wife and his family... Uh, are reacquiring stuff. Like, there's so much Frazetta in private hands, right? Um, but I'm betting if you search for Frazetta Museum, there's something, because he does have... Uh, the family is still taking care of his legacy, D. Clearman. I do love Frazetta. Yeah, well, me too, Chibi. You and me are, are very much contemporaries. I mean... But yeah, it's, it's like, well, what's the goal, right? Like, I, I do think about going back to school just to do something I'm really interested in. Like, just to honestly, like, have, you know, just do something fun. Like, it, it would be, at this point in my life, school would be fun. But I'm also in the career I want, 
going the direction I want. You know, you guys are helping me on Patreon and on Twitch, which I can't thank you enough for. Seriously, the fact that I can freelance now, that I can be valid freelancing, making my living, you have no idea. Like, this is the dream that I've had since I was a little kid. I've always wanted to be, you know, a freelance writer and artist, and that's what I'm doing. So... So, I mean, at this point, me going back to school would just be me paying a lot of money to, like, have license to spend a ton of time learning something that I've always been interested in. Like, I'd have to look at it that way. School is pricey, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, everybody goes... Yeah, you're right, Wilton's Curse. Everybody tends to... Hey, John David, how's it going? Um... <laughs> Um, but yeah, people staring at the Mona Lisa when there's stuff that's just as interesting or more so. Yeah, there's a Fred Frazetta Museum. There you go, David Clearman. I want to go, I would love to go to France and Italy. I would like to like do, do Paris, do, you know, the problem is that David and I really should take like three weeks and do a whole bunch of stuff when we're over there because, uh, there's just so much. There's so much I want to see and we love to eat and the food in France. Oh my God. And the food in Italy. Oh my God. Right. So it's, uh, there's just, it's this big question. There's so much to do. Frazetta Museum is in Pennsylvania. Awesome. Yeah, because he lived out there, so. Uh, John David Speaks, they last for over a decade. Um, I still, back, uh, now, of course, they're Sadie's paints now, but, um, in the paint department at Reaper, we have or the original bottle, an original bottle from every first batch of a color. Eventually, if a paint is popular enough, they do run out, but we still have a few. And it's been 15 years, and those are still fine. Um, so, but the key is that to get that, uh, John David, you've got to make sure that you shake them, like, somewhat regularly. Like, I'm talking shake them once, or, once every one or two years. If you let them just sit for five years in a box, not moving, you're going to notice a de degradation. I think you might even be able to get away with five years personally, but any longer than that, you're running a risk because acrylic paints are particulate and they settle out over time. And some brands are more notorious for this than others, but eventually all of that resin, that, that acrylic, latex, vinyl, whatever, settles out of the water and becomes a little plug at the bottom if you leave it too long. I think that Master Series probably takes a very long time to get there, but if you want your paints to stay good, you'll shake them every couple of years thoroughly, and you will, you know, uh, add a few drops of water probably. Pop the nipple off, add a few drops of water in there, maybe every few years, and then your paints will stay great for a, <laughs> for a decade and a half. Easy. Let me see. Hold on. Let me scroll more. Yeah, taking, like, classes at local colleges is also a great idea. I'm betting there are some great local colleges here in the in the Bay Area that are almost as good as, like, you know, or as good as uh, big universities because there's just so many. Yeah, I want to go. Um, I actually really want to see the Sistine Chapel because, as I said, I am a Michelangelo fan. Um, big time. I've always wanted to see that. My brother got to go see it. I was super jealous. <laughs> Or if you just want, like some people, okay, so, so Dragon Eye, there's a thing, right, where some people who are really busy and let themselves get distracted by a lot of other stuff, like, kind of feel like they need permission to spend a ton of time studying something they love. For those people, if they have the money, I think that the college is worth it because it essentially gives you tacit permission to spend all your time studying the thing you love. If you need that excuse, if you honestly feel guilty without that excuse, go for it. Ah, uh, Mini Monster. Any advice for miniature painters that want to get sponsored or work freelance for miniature companies? Um, well, depending on the company, Mini Monster, first of all, you've got to get to a certain level. So the first uh, thing you should be doing is looking at the level of painters who are, who are currently working for a given company and then trying to get to that level. Like I'd say you, you need to be, you need to be a very neat painter who has mastered blending, um, who understands, you know, how to highlight and shade. And uh, who can who can make his models look crisp and clean or her models, um, 
you know, because crisp and clean is necessary in order to have it photograph well. And miniatures paint miniatures companies uh, get painted models in order to photograph them and use them for advertising. So your your work has to photograph well. So those are some of the things you should work on. First, you got to get good. Then you get hired. Um, when I before I got hired for Reaper. I was out on the East Coast. I actually worked as just a miniature painter for a year. I carried a part-time job at Games Workshop for the discount, and I otherwise uh, lived on my on my art income. And what that let me do is it let me get good. Now, you don't have to do that to get good. You can get good just by giving much less time over a longer course of time, right? But it doesn't take too long overall to get to a competent level with painting. At that point, you know, you contact the company and they're going to ask for samples of your work and they're going to judge it against the people they already have working for them. So if you're trying to work for Dark Sword Miniatures, for example, he's got some of the best painters in the world working for him. And so you've got to be up there, you know, when you're, when Jim has Jennifer Haley and Marika Reimer and, you know, and, and Cat Martin and, and me <laughs> working for him, and I'm, I'm the lesser of those names, uh then you know you have to be really good. So really the first thing you need to do is invest time in your art, invest time in studying, uh, learning from other painters, getting better. Now Reaper, Reaper has, I would say, is not quite as persnickety about level, but they still need a really nice clean paint job that's going to photo well. And I mean, they've got great painters working for them, like me, like Michael Proctor, like Rhonda Bender, like Derek, Derek Schubert. We also have some Jennifer Haley. We've got a lot of painters that are really good. Corporea, um, you know, Tish Walter, you know, we've got some, some very good painters. Um, the other thing you can do is if the, if the company has a con, like ReaperCon, you can go to it. Bring your stuff, show it around, show it to, you, you Ron Hawkins is the guy for Reaper, really, um, you know, and, uh, and get feedback. Like, actually interact with the company. Show them that you're interested in their stuff. Don't try to, like, work for a company when you never paint their stuff. Like, I see people try to do that all the time. Like, in the old days, I would get a painter that contacted us, and they'd be like, hey, I want to work for Reaper. You know, I want paint minis for you. And I'd be like, okay, what have you, what have you painted from Reaper? crickets and it's like well then why are you wanting to work for us so if you want to work for a company do make sure you love the product it shows in your work um the people that ron has picked up to paint things for him have been like people who came to ReaperCon, painted amazing reaper figures and you know attracted his attention um in general those are the people who, who work for Reaper, but it's different for other companies, right? So, I mean, you can always ask a company what it takes too, but most of the time they're going to want you to either paint something on spec with no payment as, as a, you know, how can you, how well can you actually paint our product? Or they're going to want to see pictures that you've of stuff you've already painted from their company. Uh, let's see here. Do, 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 do. So in other words, there's a lot of factors, mini monster. Hold on, I've got, I've got like, I'm catching up, I'm catching up, catching up, catching up. That's great, Rax. I'm glad that they lasted that long. Uh, I'm trying to catch up to chat. Oh, no. Do, do, do. Oh, yeah, Michael and Jalos, David. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's Florence, so I, I would think it would be a good investment. Oh, uh, let's do, do, do. I'm trying to catch up. Hey there, Calisandra. I've been a long time. Good to see you. Um, bones paint is a slightly different formula, John David. Yes, the bones paints uh, were made uh, to have slightly higher coverage out the gate. They were kind of built off the same formulas as our old HD line, which is our first higher coverage paint line. A lot of the HDs were canceled. Some of them got rolled over into bones now. Um, but yeah, bones is meant to be a little bit higher coverage out the gate because a lot of people just want to use it to paint straight onto their bones minis. So, uh, so yeah, slightly different, a little bit higher coverage. Um, but the core line has, uh, a lot more, um, I want to say not gimmicks, but you know, like specialty paints, like the liners and the clears. Um, and it's, you know, got a, of course a bigger variety of paint in it, all that kind of thing. Yeah. I mean, it, it, it and also mini monster, the thing to remember is everybody's uh, journey is different, but the best thing I can do is say, invest time in your art, get to the point where you're proud of your work. 
be realistic. Look at look at the paint jobs that are already on the websites of the companies that you want to work for and kind of set that as your bar. One of the things that you can do if you like, say, really love, um, uh, say you really love Infinity models, find an Infinity model that you just love the paint job on and try to duplicate it. Like even if it's a, it's a painter who you think is really far above you right now, even in the process of trying to duplicate their paint job, you'll get better. You'll get an understanding of how they do what they do. It's never a waste of time. Um, and so, especially if they like do streams or they do, you know, if you can actually watch them work, that's even cooler. Um, but that way you can kind of judge by trying to duplicate a paint job that the company already has you can kind of judge where you are and what you need to work on. So that's really valuable information. Um, but I mean the, I mean the baseline, the baseline is, uh, is become a better painter and then like figure out which companies you really love, you know, and, uh, and try to figure out if your style is kind of what they're looking for. You know, there's, there's so many different steps. So what I'm doing here, guys, I'm accentuating the white in my Zenith. Um, I'm picking up areas that I think would stay brighter, um, that my primer wasn't quite bright enough to hit. And I'm highlighting all right down the front of the model. And this will uh, allow me to have a little bit more leeway when I put my colors over it to kind of have my highlights stick around a little longer. It's also going to just serve as a visual aid to me. Because now that I'm, I'm highlighting this, you can see how much more the light uh, is coming down. I haven't done her hat yet, and that's a big one. Um, and so it's a tool in how I'm thinking about the model, too. Oh, I'm working or busy. Yeah, I totally get it. Uh, reminder in your phone calendar to remind you to shake your paint. Ha, huh, that's a good one, Lady Dyer. Um, John David, to be frank, like, I think the bones, the bones set was made a lot later and I made it, I made all those paint lines. I created it all. I think bones is the best thing I've done, but there are key colors from core that I could never do without. So it's kind of a combo. I don't think you need the whole core line, but if you're going to buy one entire line, I'd say go bones and then cherry pick, but you could also do that in reverse. You could go MSP and then cherry pick from bones. There's, you know, it's, it's a good, it's comprehensive. Either way, you're going to get enough paint to do everything you need to do. Um, it's just a little bit different here and there. And some of the, there are some definite differences where the Bones metallics are newer technology and very different from our traditional metallics. So try, I would say try uh, of the metallics, try one of each, you know, try a little bit of each and see which one you like better. Yeah, exactly, Cornico. Yeah, Angel Geraldes, uh, Geraldes do, does a great job on the Infinity minis. But that's that's an example, right? If you wanted to work for Infinity, then you need to be able to do as well as he does. Um, or close. It, or or not maybe in his style, maybe in your style, but, you know, to be good at that level. Uh, to be able to produce a clean, sharp, fantastic-looking model. I mean, that's the, the game is high-end high these days because there's a lot of competition to get endorsements for miniatures companies. So... It, it means it's more demanding. But on the plus side, there are so many good resources out there right now. You know, this show being one of them to help you level up, right? Any of our shows and streams, there's so many miniature painting streamers and uh, so many like, you know, Twitch stuff and, and so many YouTube channels on how to paint minis better. And, and uh, you know, there's just, just a lot of resources out there for you guys, which is, makes it so much better. Like, it's so much easier for you. Um, you know, you still have to do the work, but at least you've got so many people setting a great example. Uh, and that matters. Like, I didn't have that. Um, me and people like me and like Jennifer Haley, we were a lot of self-taught. Uh, we had to do a, We had to figure a lot of it out ourselves. And, uh, although that gives us definitely, um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for that. There's something to be said for having that mental mindset that, you know, you, you can figure it out yourself, but at the same time, it took us a lot longer to learn things than, uh, it would now with so many people being willing to help. So take advantage of the wonderful and generous people. Take advantage of the great mini painting Patreons. 
take advantage of watching your, you know, supporting your favorite uh, miniature painting streamers on Twitch, you know, all that stuff. Like a lot of us are doing this for our livings now, you know, me included, and we survive by, by the support of you guys. Um, it's what, it's what lets us put so much time into sharing what we know. It's so important. Oh yeah, that's true. Um, however, if you live in a very cold climate, Don John David spe speaks, that I'd be cautious about ordering a lot of paint in the wintertime. Because if it's going to freeze solid on your porch, it can wreck it. So be careful if you live in a really cold climate. Oh, Rex, this is, uh, she's probably, Reaper's, Reaper's been creeping lately. He's been creeping bigger, and this model is quite tall. I'd say at least 30 millimeters. Hold on, I have, I have a millimeter. I have the technology to figure this out. I have a ruler. Look, it's an old-fashioned wooden ruler. Aren't you guys impressed? You can tell I'm old school on my art. Oh my god, she's huge. She's like 40 mils. Look at it. We're creeping, guys. Oh my god, we're creeping. Like, okay, so maybe 35. To the top of her head, she's about 35. From the bottom of her foot, if I scooch up and I don't... The whole miniature, including hat to the bottom of the base, is 40. But yeah, so she's she's like that. I find more and more companies are sliding that way. Here, let me look. Although, actually, I've got a Dark Sword mini that's... Patrick Keith tends to sculpt smaller still, I think. Well, maybe not. Let's see. Let's look at our Tiffling friend. Uh, top of her head to, yeah, she's almost 35. I think our 28 has become 35 these days. Maybe we're all getting older and so we're seeing 28 as a, yeah, but I was figuring the top of her head's right here. So it's still 35 millimeters, no matter which way you slice it. Well, and so are these models that I've been working on for, uh, for Dark Sword, right? The Targaryens. Notice she's almost done, guys. Isn't she snaz? Um, I just need to do the sword and the base. Uh, but yeah, and the eyeballs. But, uh. But yeah, so all of these models are quite large. We've definitely got some scale creep in the industry. And sometimes I think it is because we're all getting older and so we enjoy painting bigger models better. Oh, you've never had a problem with frozen paint? That's great, maybe I maybe one, because boy, we get so many reports every year. Maybe your mail carriers are really good about getting it to you promptly and you rescue it in time. It's when it can sit in a truck in a parking lot over the weekend that really... Uh, no, she's normal, Saltar. Yeah, I know. I don't. A twenty-eight seems small to me too. Yeah, I don't think it's that bad of a thing either, D. Clearman. I mean, everybody's. You know, they're they all tend to creep at the same time. So at least, uh, if you have a D and D party, it doesn't look too bad on the table. Like, oh well, let's look at Zari, who we're going to be creating the character sheet for later today. So she's about the same. She's a little, maybe she just, yeah, you know, she's about the same. She's about the same height. Maybe a little shorter. But, I mean, it's not any variance that you wouldn't see in a normal human, right? So, so Zari and, uh, and Ms. Fairweather are, uh, are pretty comparable. I don't mind things getting bigger because I always, I enjoy the bigger figures anyway. Because you can get more detail in on them. Oh, yeah. Like, right, and, like, try to do one of the old uh, Lord of the Rings ones that are true 25. 25 mil from the base of the feet to the top of the head. And those are some detailed figures. Because a lot of them were done with it by the Perry twins, and they knocked it out of the park for Peter Jackson. So, yeah, those suckers. Like, yeah, little tiny figures. There's a lot of that. Hey, Just Isis, how's it going? We're doing a purple pirate. I, I got distracted by accentuating my Zenithal uh, briefly because I did a very light spray at the beginning and I find that it doesn't work quite as well on 28s, although then we decided that this was actually a 35. Um, so, you know, now I've got no excuses for my Zenithal not working as well. But I do feel Zenithal works better on bigger figures. Uh, so I go back with kind of thinned white and uh, if I need to remember and kind of accentuate my lighting and I, uh, I pop it, I pop my highlights. Just as a reminder, I don't actually usually use it um, like by painting over it, like with really thin paint to keep it. I just like it as a reminder. So, so we're going to pop our highlights just a little bit to remember where our highlights are. 
I know purple, right? It's it's gonna be fantastic. I mean, here's our here's our range dices. Everybody wanted me to use icy violet, and I told them it's gonna look like magical magical modern cloth that does the reddish purple to bluish highlight, but they didn't care, so that's what we're doing. <laughs> so yeah, so our range is uh, is is reddish to bluish. It's gonna be interesting, but I wanted I really wanted this pirate to be purple. I normally do them boring and blue. I decided boring blue is not where I wanted to go today. Alrighty. Let's get some purple on this hat. I've got some purple on other things. I need to get even more purple on other things. Let's see. Let's put some of this over here. Uh, the problem is some of this is sash and some of this is coat. So I'm trying not to... Uh, oh, I thinned that down way too much. Look at how thin that got. Yeah, that's not going to cover at all. That's the original, like, 100% Eldritch Purple. It is quite transparent. So I'll just uh, take off all that excess goopiness. And uh, I'll just use a thicker paint for the hat. I'll use our original paint. All right, so... Like, you know, guys, if she's going to have a purple hat, she almost has to have a jaunty yellow feather on it. It's got to be yellow or creamy white. Got to have that complimentary thing going on. So purple hat, shiny purple hat. And here again, if I want to accentuate my zenith, I'm going to grab some of my shadow color and make this shadow quite dark, or at least noticeably darker. And I'm going to bring up my highlights. Do, 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 do. Yeah, historicals, t you're right, JT. The historicals still still tend to be true scale. But that's because they're, I mean, the historical small ones are really meant to be gamed with, and that's why, right? The more you use a model for gaming, the more it, the industry tends to resist scale creep because you've got to have your units look right together. So, or if it, if it does get scale creep, it's like Games Workshop where everything creeps at once. At that point, it's really not a creep. It's a headlong rush. Get some of these colors up here. There. So I've got to keep that, keep my highlights and shadows in mind as I work with my zenith. And then when I get down here, I've got a much darker shadow right behind this part of the hat. And then we can blend it. Oh, keep bugging. Oh, no, the Pathfinder colors are really unique, John David. Uh, Paizo worked with us to help develop that line. All of them are different from every other color. Like, you will never see duplicate colors, or you shouldn't. I mean, at least not, not as our current philosophy, you will never see duplicate colors across paint lines. So Pathfinder is unique colors chosen by Paizo to represent Pathfinder. Um, I did them according to swatches that Paizo presented. They, uh, there are some really unique colors in Pathfinder. I use a lot of them, actually. I have used a lot of them in past streams. There are some that I really love. Um, let's see, there we go. So we got that. So Pathfinder is all unique. All unique colors. So if you see a color you really love in Pathfinder, rock it. Try a couple of them. They're very. They were also created with a Bonesian technology, uh, so although they are, they also have some colors that just are naturally more transparent, just because of the pigments we had to use to match it, the formula. Tianzia Jade comes to mind, but I use a lot of uh, Pathfinder reds. Actually, if you like dark reds, um, try uh, try Asmodeus red. It's one of my faves. I love it use a lot of it. I use it to like work with all of my other reds. Let's see here. <laughs> yeah, there we go. Chibi, Chibi new. Yeah, this is a metal one. This is from Reaper Con. Here, hold on. So Bobby Jackson sculpted this part of Dark Heaven. It was a, a special edition model for ReaperCon, Storm Chasers. I just, I had it and I wanted to paint a pirate. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, Captain Fairweather from the Storm Chaser faction, which are a pirate, pirate hunting, a pirate's hunting pirates faction, as I remember, if I recall correctly. Now I've got a strong highlight down here at the front of the hat, so I've got to keep that in mind and block it in in our icy violet and then blend it. So 
So yeah, kind of a combination talking about zenithal and purple and highlights and art and stuff today. This is a good stream, guys. This is fun. It's a good one. Do do do. Yeah, purples and greens and, and reds in Pathfinder are lovely. Um, we have a European uh, clearing warehouse in the UK. Um, so if you order it through Reaper's European website, you probably can get it. I mean, I when you get when he gets orders for stuff, I believe that. I mean, look on the website. I, I can't think of why Kit wouldn't carry it over there, especially because it's our newest paint line. But. Yeah, okay. Well, if you've been using Vallejo for years, I started with Vallejo. Uh, like, back when I created Master Series, I was using a lot of Vallejo, John David. So one thing to remember, okay, right off the bat, I'm going to save you time. This is a lot thinner out of the bottle than, more liquid out of the bottle than Vallejo. Vallejo is very thick. You know, you have to add a ton of water to it to get it to, like, the point where you can blend with it or do a wash or something. Master Series is made so that if you want to put it, I usually, for base coats, I only like thin it, maybe five drops of paint to one drop of water, if that. Um, you can also use it sometimes straight out of the bottle. Uh, but you don't need to add nearly as much water to get it to blend or to do washes or glazes or any of that. So don't add as much water. Start by just working with the paint out of the bottle, get a feel for it, then graduate by just kind of adding in a little bit more water. So it's not going to be nearly as thick. And hopefully that'll save you time being frustrated because that, that's the biggest difference between the two. They're both capable of doing great blending. They're both capable, you know, of doing like good wet blends and things like that and for using them for true, true brush. They're both good for wet palette. They're both good for airbrush, although Vallejo puts out an airbrush specific line because it takes so much time to thin it. Um, but uh, yeah, but otherwise uh, the viscosity is very different. So I would say work with it out of the bottle Start adding water just a little bit and uh, move up as you gain comfort from it. Um, if you fall back into highlighting uh, ratios that you use with Vallejo, you're going to be frustrated because Master Series is going to be really thin in no time. And uh, actually, if you want to, if you want kind of a, a head start, um, John David. Um, there's a free video on Reaper's YouTube that was the class that I taught at ReaperCon this year, virtually, that was thinning MSP paints. And it's actually about how much to thin the paint to get all of the different effects and all the different like ratios that you need for like blending, textures, all this washes, glazes, all of that. It's free and it is up on the Reaper YouTube and you should be able to search for it, thinning MSP paints. And then if you go to my Patreon, which is patreon.com slash painting big, you can get a free PDF on there that uh, re encapsulates it, talks about, gives you all those ratios in written form so that you don't have to rewatch the video. You'll have it. But it, it, I think it helps to watch the video because then you can totally see, um, you know, you can see the consistencies as I'm using them. And then you can get the PDF and it'll remind you what sort of ratios you want. So hopefully that could, that could save you a lot of time and, and learning time, like just watching that and then trying those ratios. And that'll give you a feel right away for how the paint is different from Vallejo. No apostrophe, I think. Oh, there we go. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you guys for linking to the Patreon. Yeah. It's a free PDF. You don't have to be my patron to have it. Um, I did the class for free on Reaper so that I would always be able to refer people to it because it's such valuable information. Um, and then, uh, then I did that PDF for my Patreon just to give you guys a resource in print because some people really do like uh, the in print edition. I, I always was somebody who learned a lot by reading rather than watching. So I, I believe very much so in PDFs. All right, so we got our hat coming up here, guys. There's a lot of light on the hat, so. <laughs> Thank you for the subbing, John David Speaks. Yeah, we have a great community. Like, having been, you know, I've, I've been a Reaper employee for 17 years, and I've watched the community as it evolved, and I have to say we have one of the best communities anywhere in mini painting. Our people are fantastic. ReaperCon is always wonderful. Everybody is so awesome. Like, just seriously, just a great group of people. Cannot say enough. 
And I'm not only saying that because a lot of them are my patrons and my Twitch supporters. <laughs> you guys would be awesome anyway. You could all drop me like a stone. I would be so sad. But um, but I uh, I would still love you. I promise. My love is unconditional. All right, so we're probably getting up. Yeah, we're getting up to the point where Justin should start looking for a raid. Kiri's been very good. She hasn't interrupted our stream today, my old dog. Um, again, I won't be here tomorrow because Kiri's got to go to the vet. And uh, that was the only time frame I could get. Uh, so we will be going to the vet and then uh, I'll be back on Thursday. I also am on this afternoon, guys, on my own Twitch. Twitch.tv slash painting big. We are going to create the character sheet for our bard because we're going to start role playing her really soon. And so we need her character sheet. We need to decide on her skills, um, you know, and stuff like that. We get to place her attributes. Um, I rolled a bunch of dice for ability scores. It'll be fun. Um, I've never created a character in fifth edition before. So this will be, you know, me giving my thoughts on the system as well. Um, I was looking through the book a bit last night and there's some things they've done that I really like. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it, how it goes. I'm, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you all join me. That's at 4.30 uh, PM, um, USA central time. Although today we also have uh, Michael Proctor. Do we have crow's nest today? Um, Justin? Yes, we do. And the guest is going to be Ed actually. Oh, Ed. Wow. Okay. So you totally should watch that first <laughs> and then you can come over to, uh, to my Twitch channel, but you should not miss. I mean, nobody should ever miss Ed. Like, I really wanted it. I want to, like, I'm tempted to, like, put off my stream for half an hour so I can watch it. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so totally. So when you're, uh, when you're done with uh, Crow's Nest, come on over to twitch.tv slash painting big and join me for some D&D &D stuff. It'll be fun. We've been creating our world lately and our city setting, and it's just going to be so much fun. So I hope you all have had a great day. Do we have a raid, Justin? Be yeah. here. As I put, I'm going to mix some, put some really high highlights up on this uh, shoulder here. You can all see how the blue is coming in on this purple. It is a really cool looking purple now, guys. I will say that. I'm really liking it. Definitely magical. Maybe she has a... Go, go to Zambian, actually. Go to Zambies? All right. Yeah, let's go get our brains eaten. Sounds good. But yeah, I was going to say this almost looks like it. Maybe it's a, a great coat of water breathing or something, guys. Maybe it's like magical that way. And that's why it has blue highlights. Wouldn't that be cool? Like, it's totally something a pirate captain should have. Totally awesome. So thank you all for showing up today. Again, Crow's Nest will be on with Ed, none other than Ed, as uh, the interviewee. Rake him over the coals. <laughs> throw him under the bus, the Michael Proctor bus, and uh, thoroughly enjoy yourselves, and then come over and play D&D &D with me. All right? We'll see you guys later. Have a great one. Thank you guys very much. We'll see you this afternoon.